and we'll start things right off with uh, knee biomechanics. We'll jump into a uh, question here, and that uh, question focuses on the normal tibiofemoral joint kinematics that would be expected. And uh, you can see the choices that are available here. The main focus of uh, this type of question is what happens with the knee in uh, terminal knee extension. And so uh, for those that have reviewed this previously, you'll uh, recognize that the tibia undergoes internal rotation with knee flexion. So this is almost a reverse way of asking about the screw home mechanism of the knee joint. So the screw home mechanism typically is taught as tibial external rotation with terminal knee extension. But when you drop the knee into flexion, the opposite occurs. And uh, so it's the, the same question just asked in a uh, fundamentally different way. So if we look at the knee joint biomechanics, uh, fundamentally we have uh, two joints, the tibiofemoral joint and the patellofemoral joint. That's uh, obvious to all of us as orthopedic surgeons. The function of the patellofemoral joint is to transmit the forces of the quadriceps, and uh, that works through the patella itself. A paddlectomy, uh, it's well known that a paddlectomy will decrease your extension force by 30%. That has an impact on daily activities and also has some impacts on choice of total knee replacement designs as well. Some questions will come up that focus on biomechanics and contrasting joint reaction forces at the patellofemoral joint versus joint reaction forces at the tibiofemoral joint. So it is useful to look at these uh, individual tables. The first here is the patellofemoral uh, forces, and the key factors here are the force through the patella is about three times body weight going upstairs, five times body weight going downstairs, and seven times when you're squatting. Uh, the other factor in the patellofemoral joint to recognize is that the patella actually moves about seven centimeters uh, caudally and cranially during knee joint flexion and extension. Uh, so it's not just a static joint. Uh, so the point of contact changes throughout the range of motion with the maximal contact occurring at 45 degrees of flexion. There's uh, lots of interest on what stabilizes the patellofemoral uh, joint. So the patella's main static stabilizer is the medial patellofemoral ligament. And that provides 60% of the restraining force, lesser contribution from uh, other aspects and then the other thing to recognize is that the dynamic restraint at the patellofemoral joint is the quadriceps. And that leads right into the next point, which is the uh, relationship of the Q angle with patellofemoral function. So because the quadriceps has that dramatic 60% uh, effect on stabilizing the joint, the Q angle is important to recognize because that dictates the angle of pull uh, of the quadriceps. So the Q angle definition is known to uh, all of us, ASIS, to the center of the patella, to the midpoint of the tibial tuberosity. And uh, the angle that is subtended by those two lines is the Q angle. The mean is 13 degrees in males and slightly higher, 18 degrees in females. And that's with the knee in extension. In, the, uh, in flexion, it's similar between males and females at about 8 degrees. Switch to the next question, which is looking at the greatest difference between a normal knee and an ACL deficient knee? This is a little bit of a gotcha kind of question. So most people are going to think, well, the ACL is out. That's going to change how the knee moves in the anterior, posterior, or sagittal plane. But in fact, what's most affected is the axial rotation uh, of the knee joint at 50 degrees of flexion. So don't be tricked by this question. It's axial rotation at 50 degrees. This is part of the basis for why people think about doing double bundle ACL reconstructions, trying to restore that axial rotation ability of the native ACL. If we switch to the tibiofemoral articulation, their main function there is transmitting body weight from the femur to the tibia. And again, if we look at the joint reaction forces, three times body weight goes through that joint with walking, four times with climbing. The range of motion of the uh, Typical uh, knee joint is from a tiny bit of hyperextension up to 155 degrees of flexion. And it's thigh calf contact that limits your maximal flexion. And normal gait requires just 0 to 7 degrees of motion. An interesting article that you can go look at is by Michael Freeman and, uh, and Pinskarova. They looked at the normal movement of the tibiofemoral joint with some advanced kinematic analysis 
This is where the concept of a medial pivot knee essentially came from. Uh, so if you're interested in that, then the, the Michael Freeman work is a good one to look at. What often comes up is what happens with the contact point in the knee joint through a range of motion. And this is essentially the description of normal tibiofemoral rollback. Uh, so the instant center of rotation is the, uh, defined as the point where the two joint surfaces contact each other. And as the knee joint flexes, the instant center of rotation moves posteriorly. And that's what allows you to get high degrees of uh, knee joint flexion and avoid impingement. We referenced this earlier. The screw home mechanism was part of that uh, initial question. The tibia externally rotates 5 degrees in the last 15 degrees of extension. And that's because of the differential sizes of the medial and lateral side of the knee. And again, the Michael Freeman work is a good one if you want to dig into this in a little greater detail. The benefit of the screw home is it locks your knee in extension and allows your quadriceps to relax while you're standing, which is uh, useful for daily activities. What about the static stabilizers of the knee joint? Well, on the, uh, on the lateral side, it's really the lateral collateral or the Technically, the fibular collateral ligament provides the main restraint against varus stress. It's supplemented by the other structures of the posterior lateral corner. And on the medial side, it's the superficial portion of the medial collateral ligament. The deep portion really does not do very much for static stability. If you look at the uh, ACL itself, uh, the bundles of the ACL and the PCL are defined by their attachment points on the tibia, not on the femur. So if you're trying to look at what does the anteromedial and posteromedial bundle do, well, they are uh, defined by, again, that position on the tibia. The anteromedial bundle is tight in flexion, while the posterior lateral is tight in extension. Seems unlikely that on a recon test they're going to uh, go into this, but uh, it, is, uh, it is possible, I guess. We switch and look at the posterior cruciate ligament. Similarly, two major bundles that uh, work differentially in flexion and extension. And of course, the main function of the posterior cruciate ligament is that it's the primary static restraint to posterior translation of the tibia on the femur. The posterior lateral corner, which I referenced previously, is the primary stabler, stabilizer of external tibial rotation. And when we look at failures of uh, cruciate reconstruction, many times it's an unrecognized posterior lateral corner injury, which results in failure of an ACL or PCL reconstruction in 2017. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.